welcome to another episode of Everyday Black History. Now today on Everyday Black History, we're going to be highlighting a man by the name of Dr. Charles Drew. And Dr. Charles Drew was an American, African-American physician, surgeon, and medical researcher. And he's, he researched in the field of blood transfusions, he developed improved techniques for blood storage, and he applied his expert knowledge to developing large-scale blood banks early in World War II. This allowed uh, for many medics to save lives during the war and allowed for uh, blood storage and blood uh, collection throughout the country. The research and develop, um, uh, the research and development of you know, his work actually allowed for um, uh, many organizations like the Red Cross to be influenced by his, uh, by his work as well as other organizations that started to develop uh, the techniques that he put into practice for blood storage, for uh, blood donation, and even for uh, transfusion. Now, as the most prominent African-American in the field, uh, he protested against the practice of racial segregation and the donation of blood. I mean, because as we all know, it doesn't make any sense not to give a black man a white man's blood or vice versa just because of the color of their skin. And him as a scientist knew that it lacked scientific foundation. And because of this, he even resigned his position with the American Red Cross, which maintained that policy until 1950. But we'll uh, talk a little bit about his background, uh, get a little bit about his uh, early life. He was born in 1904 um, to an African-American middle class family in Washington, D.C. And his father was a carpet layer and his mother was a teacher. Uh, him and his siblings, they grew up in the Foggy Bottom uh, area in D.C., and he graduated from Dunbar High School in 1922, where he and then he won an athletic scholarship to Amherst College in Massachusetts, where he graduated in 1926. Uh, while in college, he also joined uh, one of uh, the well-known uh, African-American fraternities, uh, Omega Psi Phi, while he was there. And after that, he after uh, college at Amherst, he attended medical school at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, where he received his um, MD, uh, C, his um, MDCM in 1933, and he was ranked second in his class of 127 students. A few years after that, he did graduate work at Columbia University, where he earned his Doctor of Medical Science degree, becoming the first African American to do so. Now, in the 1940s, he was distinguished in his profession. In his profession, and he was recognized when he became the first African American surgeon selected to serve as an examiner on the American Board of Surgery. Uh, he had a lengthy research and teaching career and became a chief surgeon as well as you know his work in uh, the blood field. Um, in late 1940, before uh, the U.S. joined uh, in World War II. Uh, he was, and before he earned his doctorate, he was recruited to help set up and administer uh, an early prototype program for blood storage and preservation. He was to collect, test, and transport large quantities of blood plasma for distribution in the United Kingdom. Uh, he went to New York City as the medical director of the United States Blood for Britain project, which was a project to aid British soldiers and civilians by giving them U.S. blood to the, to the United Kingdom. Uh, he started what would be later known as blood mobiles, where, uh, which were trucks that contained refrigerated, refrigerators of stored blood, which allowed for greater mobility in terms of transportation, as well as for prospective donations. Uh, he created a central location for the blood collection process where donors could go to get blood, and he made sure that all blood plasma was tested before it was shipped out, and that only skilled personnel handled the blood to avoid blood contamination and the spread of disease. The Blood for Britain uh, program operated successfully for five months with a total collection of almost 15,000 people donating blood and over 5,500 vials of blood plasma. And as a result, the Blood Transfusion Betterment Association applauded him for his work. And out of his work came the American Red Cross Blood Bank, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, the American Red Cross was actually influenced by his work in uh, um, blood uh, preservation as well as collection and storage. Um, unfortunately, he died at a young age, at only the age of 45, he died in a car accident in 1950. Uh, beginning in 1939, he, he traveled to Tuskegee, Alabama to attend 
uh, an annual free clinic at the John A. Andrew Memorial Hospital. And in 1950, he was driving home. He was driving back with three other black physicians in a car. And um, around 8 a.m. on April 1st, he was since he was fatigued from spending the night before in the operating th theater at uh, the hospital, the Andrew Memorial Hospital, he lost control of the vehicle and careened into a field where the car flipped three times. Now, the other, the other three physicians escaped with minor injuries, but unfortunately, he was trapped inside the car with serious wounds, and um, he died after uh, being taken to the hospital a half, a half an hour after receiving medical attention. Um, his funeral was held April 5th in um, 1950 at Washington, in Washington, D.C., now, um, there's a, uh, it's a popular myth about his death that the reason why he died was because he didn't receive a blood transfusion because he was black. Um, but one of the doctors that rode in the car with him, John Ford, said that his injuries were so severe that nothing could have saved them um, uh, from death and that a blood transfusion actually would have uh, sped up his, his death. Um, the myth states that the hospital not only didn't... Uh, uh, service him because of his skin color, but that there wasn't enough Negro beds available at that hospital and that the nearest hospital only served whites. But as mentioned, one of the doctors in the car with him said that, you know, his he died from his severe injuries. But we can see just from what we went over as far as his work and even the, the fact that he influenced all these other, you know, American institutions and organizations because of his work, we can see that his legacy is very strong. Um, in 1981, there was a stamp made in his likeness. Um, there's also uh, uh, neighborhoods in D.C. that are named after him. Uh, a dry cargo ship, the U.S. N.S. Uh, Charles Drew, was named after him. There are areas in Montreal, Quebec, that are named in, um, from him. And numerous schools and health-related facilities, as well as other institutions, have been named in his honor. There are about 10 medical and higher education facilities named um, in his likeness, as, and there's, there's over 14 uh, schools from kindergarten to 12th grade that are named after him all over the country. So based off of that, as mentioned, we can see his legacy is, is very alive because of his work. And, you know, we highlight him because as a black man, you know, with a legacy this strong, he contributes to black history and black culture. And so, Dr. Charles Drew, as we do with everyone who we highlight on Everyday Black History, we salute you for it. Now, that concludes this episode of Everyday Black History. Please tune in as we'll be having more episodes uh, where we'll be talking about black men and women and institutions that contributed to black history and black culture um, and, and also just changed the way of life for uh, many people worldwide. So, stay tuned for the next episode. <laughs>